Good morning. Welcome to the Boise Unitarian Universalist Fellowship's Zoom worship service. I'm Patricia Heeb. I'm your celebrant this morning. Boof is a community gathered to nurture spiritual growth, real connection, and a faithful action for a better world. All who join us in the spirit of curiosity, love, and justice are welcome. I particularly want to acknowledge those newcomers among us. We are glad you've joined us. We invite you to introduce yourself in the chat so our community can uh, welcome you properly. And so we can keep you up to date with all that's happening in our fellowship. We offer a lot of options for gathering in virtual community from meditation to yoga to social hours. Look also in the chat for information about the Inquirer's class, a several session class for newcomers to Booth and Unitarian Universalism. It is our practice here in the fellowship to donate 25% of the plate offering to support our social justice ministries. For the month of August, our plate partner is Jesse Tree, focused on eviction and homelessness prevention in Treasure Valley. We are pleased to have Ali Rabi tell us more about their work. Ali. Thank you, Patricia, and thank you all for having, having me here um, to talk about Jesse Tree and the work that we do in the community. Jesse Tree was started 20 years ago out of conversations with people experiencing homelessness and uh, members of the faith-based community here in our inner town asked people who were living outside how they ended up in that situation in the first place. And they heard the same story over and over again. Basically, people had had a difficult month or a difficult year. They got to a place where they couldn't pay their rent and here they were homeless months or years later. So as you can imagine, um, the need for what we do continues to grow. We so out of, you know, out of those conversations, we started to provide financial support to people when they were in a financial crisis to keep them in their home. And um, more and more people now are living on the line with the rising cost of rent, which increased 38% last year. Uh, wages are staying the same. So more and more people are getting to a place for the first time in their lives where they have an unanticipated expense or shortfall, their kid gets sick, they lose their job, and then they can't pay their rent. And so what we do is we step in and provide financial assistance and supportive services from a case manager uh, and get them through their uh, financial crisis and keep them in their home. Um, with uh, your donation last year, we were able to raise $5,000 and pay rent for four families um, while providing them with case, ma case management and supportive services, keeping them in their home. So uh, thank you for that. That's four families that, you know, didn't end up homeless, didn't go to shelters or have to live in their car. And you think of the, all the positive financial and social and health impacts that has on a family and those kids as well. Um, so thank you for being a part of this work. Um, you know, the need continues to grow um, as our housing crisis worsens here, but we are able to solve for this one family at a time. We know that 97% of the people that we've assisted over the last three years are still in their housing. We just think that and really believe in our mission and, you know, the starting out of those conversations that happened in our community 20 years ago, where if you can give somebody some support at a time when they really need it, um, you can prevent homelessness. So thanks for being a part of that and for having me today. Thank you, Ali. We really appreciate what you're doing out there. Joining me in presenting the service this morning are Carrie with music, Jem Emerson Page with our Time for All Ages, and the one who makes sure that this can all happen. Thank goodness for Rachel, our tech host, and Nancy Harms, who, who just sweeps up all the uh, leftovers so that they're sorted out into a real service. And uh, since neither Ollie or I are really technical Zoom people, um, we really thank them and probably you should too. 
Our speaker today is Ollie Newman. Ollie's an active member here at the fellowship. He's a man of gentle spirit, insight, and he's definitely an out of the box thinker. In today's service, he describes his journey of disconnecting from Zoom church services and what that taught him about himself and how we interact with each other. We gather together today, as we gather together, we want to acknowledge that the land that our church and our homes are built on it is actually the ancestral land from the Shoshone Bannock, the Shoshone Paiute, Coeur d'Alene, Kootenai, Nez Perce, and many other tribes whose names have gotten lost to history, all of whom inhabited a vast region, including much of Idaho, before they were rounded up and forced to leave. We acknowledge that our presence here today is founded on those exclusions and erasures of many indigenous people. With this acknowledgement, we hope to demonstrate a commitment to the ongoing work of dismantling the legacies of settler colonialism, honoring the indigenous people's connection to the land and supporting their right to sovereignty. Let's Take a moment now to breathe together. Fill your body with breath. Knowing that our breath connects us to one another, to our bodies and to our planet. Our breath offers us an opportunity for stillness, to tune into our spiritual center, to listen deeply to our heart's own longing. Let your heart choose to whom the thines and the vows of our ritual poem are directed. Thou art the song of my heart in the morning. Thou art the dawn of truth in my soul. Thou art the dew of the roses adorning. Thou art the woven whole. Thine is the grace to be steadfast in danger. Thine is the peace that none can destroy. Thine is the face of the neat driven stranger. Thine are the wings of joy. Thou art the deep to the deep in me calling. Thou art a lamp where my feet shall tread. Thy way is steep past the peril of falling. Thou art my daily bread. Thine be the praise of my spirit uplifted. Thou art the sea of each flowing stream. Thine be the days that are gathered and sifted. Thou art the deathless dream. Each week we light our flaming chalice, a symbol of our free faith a beacon of hope, love, and justice. We, ah, there's Carrie. See, see why we need all these people to do this service. <laughs> Go ahead, Carrie.
Now, now each week we light our chalice. It's a symbol of our free faith, a beacon of hope, love, and justice. We join in this lighting in solidarity and community with hundreds of other Unitarian Universalists lighting chalices today in homes and in virtual worship services, reminding us that we are connected to one another and to a larger community of faith and love. If you have a chalice nearby, you're invited to light, light it with us this morning and then hold up your chalice to the camera and click on gallery view to see all of the chalice lights. And then you're invited to share in the chat where your chalice is lit. With our collective chalices lit in all of our spaces, we offer you this call to worship adapted from the poem by Mary Oliver. The spirit likes to dress up like this, 10 fingers, 10 toes, shoulders, and all the rest. It needs the body's world, instinct and imagination, and the dark hug of time, sweetness, and tangibility to be understood, to be more than pure light that burns where no one is. So it enters us. Come, let us worship together. I invite everyone to cozy up for our time for all ages this morning. So today, let's keep it sweet and simple. Words are valuable, but our bodies are more reliable sources of wisdom. It's sometimes more important to connect in with what our bodies need. Often, it's moving and moving together, laughing, playing, singing, celebrating, Making a space to feel joy and sorrow together. This is a beautiful way to connect to our bodies and to one another. Our story this morning is going to help us explore the impact our presence has on other people and how we can show that we love and accept one another. So it is um, a lovely book. I'm so excited. And as I'm going to read it, I invite you to join me through movement and laughter and calling out. I'm gonna give clear directions, don't worry about it. Please be as loud and as wiggly as fits the space around you and as is respectful to the people around you, but it's okay to take up space. Our story this morning is Elmer by David McKee. Elmer by David McKee. And this book was donated to us in December of 2001 by the Chambers family. And what an absolutely generous gift that we are still using to this day. There once was a herd of elephants. Elephants young, elephants old, elephants tall and short fat and thin. All were different, but all were happy and 
almost all were the same color. All except Elmer. Elmer was not elephant color, he was patchwork. Elmer was yellow and orange and red and pink and purple and blue and green and black and white. Everyone join me in saying, wow, ooh, ah, these gorgeous colors. It was Elmer who kept the other elephants happy. Their games and jokes were always his idea. If an elephant was laughing, the cause was usually Elmer. Here, if we can all lift up your arms and help hold up this elephant. Elephants are, we need lots of us to join in. And as we do, let's laugh. Ha ha ha. Hee hee hee, what a fun game. I think that Elmer himself wasn't happy. Whoever heard of a patchwork elephant? No wonder they laugh at me. That's hard to know the difference. How do you know when someone is laughing at you or you? He's having a hard time. He's nervous. Just waking up. Elmer slipped away. Can we all pretend to tiptoe? I know we're sitting down, but maybe we can just lift up our, our feet so we're on the tip of our toes and quietly walk away. As he walked through the jungle, Elmer met other animals and they called out everybody and joined me. Morning, Elmer. Good morning, Elmer. All of these animals, they know exactly who he is. And they're all friendly towards him. After a long walk, Elmer found what he was looking for, a log covered with elephant colored berries. It's tiring work. I'm doing, you might not be able to see me, but I'm doing all of this stuff with you. <laughs> then Elmer laid down and rolled over the berries this way and that. He picked up bunches of berries and rubbed himself all over until he was covered with berry juice. Can everyone pretend to roll? and shake and rub berry juice all over your legs and your arms. When he was finished, there wasn't a sign of any yellow or orange or red or pink or purple or blue or green or black or white. Elephant, Elmer, looked just like any other elephant. On his boy back through the jungle, Elmer passed the other animals and they called out. If you will join me in calling out, Good morning, elephant. Good morning, elephant. Can't they look kind of blue? Oh. Much attention to him. But neither are they. When Elmer rejoined the herd, none of the other element elephants noticed him. They're all sleepy and quiet, hanging out. It's been a long morning. As he stood there, Elmer felt that something was wrong. But what? He looked around. Same old jungle, same old blue sky, same old rain cloud, same old elephants. Hmm, that's a thinker. If you want me to say. Hmm. Something's wrong. There's that same old rain cloud. The other ele elephants were standing absolutely still, silent, and serious. Elmer had never seen them so serious before. It made him want to laugh. Finally, he could bear it no longer. He lifted his trunk and at the top of his voice, Jack. Boo! Everyone, will you join me in shouting in surprise of the elephants? They jumped with surprise. Ah! Yeah! 
<laughs> Elmer was helpless with laughter. Then the others began to laugh. Ha 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 ha. isn't here to share the fun, they said, laughing harder and harder. How interesting. Even when Elmer's not around that they can see their then the rain cloud burst. Isn't this interesting? It used to be gray, but now they're inside of it. It's got many colors. When the rain fell on Elmer's patchwork show. Oh, Elmer, gasped an old elephant. <gasps> That's Elmer. Elmer was washed back to normal. You've played some good jokes. But this has been the biggest laugh of all. What would we do without you? We must celebrate this day every year, said another. The day of Elmer's best joke. All of That is a big switcheroo. Now we're at the end of this book. We're towards the end of this book. In the beginning, Elmer was really unsure of how others thought of him. But what do you think? Are they laughing at him or with him? One day each year, the elephants color themselves yellow or orange or red or pink or purple or blue or green or black or white and have a parade. If you happen to see an elephant in the Elmer's Day Parade, who is ordinary elephant color, you will know who it, it must be Elmer. Now for our final wiggle activity, I would love for us to join in the parade like you're marching. Some of these folks will be clanging tambourines or cymbals together. Some are drumming, some are triangles, some are just marching. So I'd love everybody if we could Maybe check out our gallery view. Everybody to take a place in the parade and make a movement. I'm going to be cracking symbols over here <laughs> quietly by myself. Not by myself. We're all together. That is the end of our book. We end with a joyful parade. I really was wiggling along with y'all, clanking my tambourines, helping hold Elmer up. I wonder how would you dress up for this parade? What kind of colors would you, and crazy patterns, would you hold over your body or dress yourself in? That's a better way of phrasing that. What would you want your friends and family to celebrate about you if you had your own parade? It feels good to take up some space, to let your body move, roll on berries, and to let your voice ring out. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> I'm having fun with this one. How can we better make room for each other so that we can take up space? When is a time you felt like your presence mattered? How did that feel in your heart and in your body? I thank everyone so much for joining in on this wonderful parade. Um, and I invite you to join me in singing our community blessing as we bless this multi-generational community full of ever learning, ever growing, ever justice seeking beloveds. Thank you.
Thank you, Carrie. What a delight. When we give, we say yes to something of value. We say yes to supporting the greater good, to saving what we love. We take up an offering each week to say yes to the values of our faith and yes to the self-sustaining ministries of this fellowship and the ministry of our plate partner, Jesse Tree. Altogether, we use your gifts to serve with ever greater love. You will find information about how to make a donation online in your chat window. And we thank you in advance for your generosity. The offering will now be received. Do not stand at my grave and weep I am not there, no, I do not sleep Do not stand at my grave and cry I am not there, no, I am alive that blow I am the diamond glints on snow I'm the sun on ripened grain I'm the gentle autumn rain Do not stand at my grave and Star that shines at night Do not stand at my grave and
For the last year and a half, in the separation and isolation of the pandemic, even though we are grateful for Zoom, we have missed being together. This video from Green Renaissance reminds us how sweet it is that we are really all connected. A man is an island. We cannot thrive alone. We can survive, but we cannot thrive. In Pondo, we sing Umdu Ngumdu Ngabandu Nangemvelo. The person is the person because of the other people. Without other people, You're not a person. Here, in this village, it's not about me. It's not about me, myself. We are all connected. We as human beings are wired for connection. We need other people, not to complete us, because that's the wrong word, and they say those in the movies, but we need other people to, to love and to be loved by. I think there's a lot to be said for the human connection. We're all supposed to connect in some way or other. I don't know about everybody else, but I get something from that, where you actually speak to people and interact with them. You get back to your, your human side. It doesn't sound much, but it's given you peace in here and peace in there. It's quite a biggie. Community, which is created through connection, has been lost a lot in this world. We are isolating ourselves, we are breaking up into little family pockets. Sometimes I think there's too much technology involved in life, you know? Instead of actually holding a conversation with somebody, you send them a wee message, electronic message. But it's not real. You're not meeting people. You're not grabbing somebody's hand and shaking it. We think that we know what's going on in people's lives because we see their Instagram posts or their social media posts. But that's the surface. We just see their highlights. We don't know what they're actually experiencing in their lives. But I think the more we nurture community, the more we'll create connections and the, the happier we become. I, I always 
always think that that it mattered to to be seen. I make sure every time when I'm with people that I'm really like giving my full attention and hearing uh, which story they have because the world is a tough place and and we we need to be nicer one to each other. I've built my life around my relationships. I know who I am through my relationships. I really believe we should be more honest with each other and really tell the people that that we love that we love them. And and also s tell them what we see in them. Even if it's something scary or something hard or something angry. I think it's really important that we tell people how we feel now. And it's really important that we get vulnerable with one another. I think that there's a rampant addiction to comfort and that actually if we're going to come alive, we need to get a little uncomfortable now and then. There's so much that happens that we don't talk about that actually makes life really difficult. I think it's very important to also see the darkness and to actually bring those experiences into the light. Just because your experiences are different to mine doesn't mean that we can't have a conversation and that we can't disagree. When we disagree with each other, that's when we learn about each other. And that's when we learn how to work together. The reason most people don't share how they feel is fear. We hold back. We, you know, we're more reserved. We're worried what people will think. People are so afraid of, of not being accepted and not being loved, but what they don't realize is that actually the only way you're going to be loved is if you give love. It's a two-way street, and one of you has to be brave enough to take that first step. I started telling people how I feel about them and sharing my feelings when I realized that there was no point hiding, that actually by not sharing how we feel about people, we're actually hiding. We're hiding who we are. We're hiding parts of ourselves. I realized that I was kind of skirting the surface of living life fully, and that actually there was another level that I could get to, another level of appreciating every single moment of my life, whether they're good or bad. And I think that's what living life fully is. Everybody deserves to be seen. Every, everybody's story counts. Just depends if you know how to listen. We just need to allow space for people to, to do that. Um, to shine. <laughs> you must connect with your nature, with your people surrounding you. That makes you a human. Someone told me the other day that I give really great hugs. And I was like, oh, I felt that. That was really nice. And I would prefer to hear that now than, you know, find out that it was said at my funeral. <laughs> you know? And it, it's, it's um, because that's enriched my life and that's made me feel closer to that person. One of my favorite quotes by a woman called Danielle Laporte is, find your tribe and love them hard. You don't know how long the people that are in your life are gonna be in your life, so show them the appreciation 
when you have the time, in the, in the moment. Don't wait. And there is so much power in the present moment. When we start living from that place, that's when magic happens. Indeed, we are all connected. And so each week we take time to acknowledge the many joys and sorrows among us, as it's that sharing that spins the threads that bind us into a loving community. We share this sorrow from Deborah Smith. Her mother, Charmaine, grandmother to Will and Jim Emerson Page, passed away Wednesday morning, gently and peacefully. She had expressed that she felt no fear and was looking forward to seeing her husband again after all this time. As we listened to For a Dancer by Jackson Brown, performed by Michael McLennan, you're invited to write your joys and sorrows in the chat box and then take a moment to read them all. Keep 
the fire for the human race Let your prayers go lifted into space You never know what will be coming down Perhaps a better world is drawing deep But just as easy you could all disappear Along with whatever meaning you might have found Don't let the uncertainty turn you around Go on and make it joyful sound Somewhere between the time you arrive and time to go may lie the reason you were alive, but you never know. We hold the joys and sorrows of our beloved community alongside the silent prayers that we hold close to our hearts. Gathered up with the joys and sorrows of our nation and the world, we hold them all close, breathing them in and sending forth love. Sometimes you don't get to be a Buddha. Sometimes you just have to break and feel. You have to lose your precious spiritual awakening and just be a human being feeling. Sometimes old pain resurfaces, old fears, sorrows, trauma, the searing ache of an abandoned child, the rage of a forgotten universe. And suddenly, all of your spiritual insights crumble before you. And all the beautiful words by the beautiful spiritual teachers, all the concepts and ideas about awakening and enlightenment, and the pure perfection of pure untainted awareness, and the selfless non-self self and the path to glorious futures and the wise guru, suddenly they're all meaningless, kind of empty words, secondhand drivel and kind of dead to you. What's real now and alive is the fire in the belly, the fire in the heart unavoidable, intense, so close, so present. Sometimes you just have to feel you have no choice and sense your feet on the ground and breathe into the discomfort and trust and maybe trust that you cannot trust right now and take it moment by moment by moment by moment and know that nothing is working against you and awaken from your dream of how this moment should be and throw away all your secondhand ideas about the past 
Sometimes your spirituality has to shatter so you can realize this deeper spirituality of feeling and presence and feet on the ground living. And the sound of the birds singing in the distance and a total surrender to this one precious moment. That was The Shattering by Jeff Foster. Confessions of an Anti-Zoomer. What a very strange title for a Zoom service. Because truthfully, it's been Zoom that has for well over a year now kept this fellowship together, at least virtually. It has kept most of us connected, engaged, and able to explore new ideas and new ways of being with each other. Without Zoom, I don't know how Booth could have made it, frankly, especially during the lockdown times. And yet, after just a few weeks of church Zoom, I dropped out. That was the start of my own personal journey through a period of feeling intense loss and somewhat disconnected from this fellowship. Zoom, like any other technical communication, certainly has its drawbacks. For me personally, how that technology impacted my body and my soul caught me off guard and brought me back to an earlier journey through grief and loss, a journey that ultimately saved my life. In a New York Times article titled, Why Zoom is Terrible, Kate Murphy wrote, if you really want to communicate with someone in a meaningful way, video can be vexing. This is foremost because human beings are exquisitely sensitive to one another's facial expressions. Authentic expressions of emotion or an intricate array of minute muscle contractions, and particularly around the eyes and the mouth, often subconsciously perceived and essential to our understanding of each other. But those telling twitches all but disappear on a pixelated video, or worse, they're frozen and smoothed over or delayed by bandwidth issues. Not only does this mess with our perception, it also plays havoc with our ability to mirror each other. And mirroring each other is what we do as humans. It's a constant, almost synchronous interplay between people. To recognize emotion, we have to actually embody it. We have to feel it, which makes mirroring essential to empathy and connection. When we can't do that seamlessly, as happens during a video chat, we often feel unsettled because it's hard to read people's reactions. When Booth started these Zoom services, I seriously gave it the old college try. I tried to stay attentive and engaged, but it took a lot of effort. The issue wasn't about content. People presented interesting and insightful topics with beautiful music. Still, I found myself efforting to and working hard at staying present with a video screen. The reason is both deeply personal and as I've learned in chatting with others, more common than I thought. To better explain, I'm gonna take you on a personal journey and start with this initial thought. For some people, including me, how we embody who we are 
both as physical beings and spiritual travelers does not translate very well into technology. On my business card for work, there's a bunch of initials after my name. In fact, there's lots of them representing advanced degrees in several disciplines and certifications and subspecialties. So that certainly qualifies me as a smart person in the traditional sense, or so I thought at one time. After my first couple of degrees, I was working at both Duke University and the University of North Carolina, and things were going really well with my career. I was advancing rapidly. Then one day I got this crazy idea that I wanted to become a massage therapist. And that thought came out of nowhere because I had never had a craving for it as a career. But something whispered, whispered in my ear. I heard something deeper tell me, you need to do this. Well, like a good learner, I put all my effort into this new endeavor. I worked hard, I studied hard, too much efforting as it turned out. In massage school, the final exam was to have me videotaped working on someone. Afterwards, I watched that video with my instructor. She said to me, tell me what you see, Ollie. What do you see in this video? And I was horrified. I said, I look like the weight of the world is on my shoulders. I don't look at ease. I don't look comfortable. I really look like I want to be somewhere else. And she agreed. In truth, I really was somewhere else. Having been sexually abused as a child, I was an expert at disassociating or more simply, I did not know how to be present with people. The next day, my instructor took me into a private massage space at the school. She sat me down on the edge of the table and then she sat next to me and I felt my body kind of tense up. Very slowly and gently, she put her hands on my shoulders, light as a feather. And I shuddered. My body had never received such a gentle touch before in my entire life. And I broke down. I was crying and shaking and swaying and hollering. My body temperature dropped rapidly and she wrapped me in layers of blankets to, and held me really close to her. And she simply said, I'm here for you. I was drenched in a cold sweat and it would be an hour before I could feel my feet again. That teacher opened the door for me. Hers was the first of many sessions over the next two decades with body-centered psychotherapists, counselors, and other practitioners of the healing arts. I discovered that trauma recovery is often not quick and not easy. And I had to face a hard truth that my drive for advanced degrees, while that was certainly admirable and led to some great careers, was also my way of disassociating from myself. To paraphrase James Joyce, he lived a short distance from his body. My healing journey centered around paying very close attention to my physical being. Movement became my way of reconnecting to myself, to my soul and being present in this world. I gravitated towards anything that spoke to me on a physical level. I joined an ecstatic dance group I dived into chance circles. I did trance dance in the pagan community. And I had many solo walkabouts where I simply listened to my inner guide. I even attended a few Pentecostal revival meetings to feel how they embodied the Holy Spirit and holy cow, how they did that. 
They would dance and holler and sway with the spirit and I felt it in my bones. Through movement, my body became alive again. Through movement, I was able to integrate all the parts of me that had split away. I was beginning to feel like a whole person again. I danced to the rhythm of something much larger than myself. My massage practice became a living, breathing force of its own, and my connections with people ran much deeper. In his book, The Anatomy of Change by Richard Heckler, he describes those transformations in this way. In order to embody and use herself as a source of learning, we need to identify with the life of the body. To live in our body and be aware of what we feel, taste, touch, hear, and see, we must shift our attention from analyzing and remembering information to feeling and sensing. Bringing attention to our body vitalizes and empowers our actions. Without it, our life is mostly mechanical. We go through the motions, but we're not truly with ourselves in a meaningful way. The great philosopher Bob Marley put it this way, he who feels it knows it more. Zoom had taken me backwards from connection and wholeness to a disembodied world where I could not read what was really going on with other people. I couldn't see or feel their body cues. I felt a great sense of loss. Zoom saved this fellowship. It truly did, but it lost me. Of course, that was my own journey and my own experience, but I know in talking to other people that it's not a solitary experience. In my work environment, I help people learn how to live with grief and loss rather than get over it and move on. I've come to believe that getting over things is neither healthy nor in most cases even possible. In my sessions, we work together on how to open up the heart to embrace many contradictory feelings, joy and pain, grief and gratitude, holding things close and distant at the same moment. That's a prescription for life as well as loss. By fully embracing this sense that I had lost my booth community, by holding it close and feeling it deep in my bones, I knew I would find my way home again to this fellowship. And as Dorothy says, there is no place like home. I have missed all of you, including those of you I do not know, except through a passing smile, eyes that would say hello, a gentle touch on my shoulder. Zoom reminded me of what I needed to rebalance myself, namely a grounding in the real world of body and soul and spirit all moving together. As some of the restrictions around COVID have loosened, I am feeling myself coming back from this place of exile, my long walkabout, if you will. And so here we are with the possibility of joining together again as a fellowship in a truly embodied way, with our senses once again being invited to wake up and see what is right in front of us. And when I feel into that, my body shivers with a joyous sense of yes. I invite you now to feel into your own body. Notice the pressure of your body against your seat, your feet against the floor, feel the hair on your head, feel the breath in your lungs, a total surrender to this one precious moment as Ollie brings our closing words. May we remember 
the caring touch of a stranger, the eyes of someone in pain, the arms that hold us when all else feels like it's falling away, our feet connecting us to the ground, the intense physicalness of anger and love and joy and grief and unbearable pain and our body as the temple of our soul. May we know each other, not only with our thoughts or our words, but with the beautiful presence of our bodies, our breath, our physical closeness, which our souls ached for during this past year. May we remember that we are so much more than our brains on Zoom. We are movers, we are dancers, we are voices singing together. You might know the lyrics to our closing song and you are invited to sing along. your sense of wonder You get your fill to eat but always keep that hunger May you never take one single breath for granted God forbid love ever leave you empty handed I hope you still feel small when you stand beside the ocean Whenever one door closes, I hope one more opens Promise me that you'll give faith a final chance And when you get the choice to sit it out or dance I hope you dance I hope you Hope you never feel those mountains in the distance Never settle for the path of least resistance Living might mean taking chances there were taken Loving might be a mistake, but it's worth making Don't let some hell-bent heart leave you bitter Come close to selling out, reconsider Give the heavens above more than a passing glance And when you get the choice to sit it out or dance I hope you dance Whenever one door closes, I hope one more opens Promise me that you'll give faith a fighting chance but When you get the choice to sit it out or dance
let us now join back together in holy presence with each other. Let us dance until there is nothing left but the dance, the movement, the joyous ecstasy of being here in this body and in this moment. May it be so.